Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to today's webinar, um, Form Builder 101, The Art of Form Building. My name is Elahe and I'll be your host for the day. Um, I hope that all of you who are joining us are somewhere a little bit sunnier than Northern Virginia with the gloomy, rainy weather today. October 4th and 6th, we'll be having the next round of the Form Builder certification. Um, so those of you who aren't certified yet, it's a really great opportunity to dive deeper into the platform, um, you know, go over the things that you'll learn today and in other webinars a little more deeply and a little more um, personally as, as it relates to your projects. So that'll be next week, and there's still space if you'd like to register. With that, I'll turn it over to John, today's presenter. All right, El. Hey, thank you so much, and welcome to Form Building 101, everyone. Uh, like Elahe said, my name is John, and I am a solutions engineer here at Zarin Software. Uh, and I'm going to be going over uh, some of the basics that I like to uh, communicate to people who are either new to using iForm Builder in the platform or to those people who have been using iForm for a little bit longer but want to uh, brush up on their fundamentals and some of the basic concepts that may, be, uh, may help you be more successful moving forward. So we're going to be going over three different topics today during this webinar. The first thing we're going to talk about is planning your iForm Builder project. And I actually think this is the most important step in making sure that you have a successful data collection project. Uh, you want to make sure that you have everything planned out at first and you have a, a solid path towards success. Each one of the different aspects of the planning that we're going to discuss is then going to lead into a best practice that we have regarding your form building. Uh, these best, best practices are tips and tricks that we have, uh, we have developed over time, both through use of the platform and also interacting with people who are using the platform in the community and getting feedback from them. And so I want to go ahead and share those best practices with you. And finally, we're going to take those planning steps, those best practices, and I want to actually go through uh, the process of taking a, a paper form and what it would look like as you transition to digitizing your data collection and using iForm Builder to do that. At any point during the webinar, if you guys have any questions, uh, just go ahead and type them in chat, or uh, you can use the GoToMeeting interface and raise your hand. Elahe will be able to take care of that, and she can just go ahead and interrupt me, and I will be sure to answer any questions that you guys have. So, moving forward, these initial project considerations are meant to be phrased in the sense of a question, and you want to consider the answers to these questions before you start your project. The first initial project consideration is what element you should use for each input. With iForm Builder, we have a lot of different elements or ways you can input and collect your data, and each one of them is going to have a specific use case for when you want to implement it in your forms. Uh, oftentimes, there are going to be elements that are going to be best suited for the type of data that you want to collect, and that it's going to improve the quality of your form as well as minimize the, the errors and corrections you may have to to address later on. The second initial project consideration is going to be how you should structure the form and if you can split up your form into different subforms. Now, I want to briefly take a moment to explain what a subform is, just in case some of the uh, their audience members may not know. A subform is, a, is basically a form that you call within another form. So if I have a form and there's a small section of it, I can take that section of the form, build it out separately, and connect it to what I'm going to call my parent form, or the original form. And using subforms is a really good way to uh, divide your workflow up. It's a real good way to also make the data collection process easier for your end users. The third initial project consideration is asking yourself what type of naming convention you want to use for your forms. So assuming we're going to break our form up into subforms, and assuming that you're going to have multiple data collection projects as well, you want to make sure you come up with a naming convention that is going to be easy to understand and will help you uh, and allow you to find your forms quickly as you build an ever-increasing forms library. Uh, later on when we talk about best practices, I'm going to go ahead and share a naming convention that we've developed over time that I feel is a really good compromise of both being brief but also being descriptive as well. The fourth project consideration is asking yourself how data collectors will interact with the forms. 
you always want to make sure that you keep the end user in mind, the data collector, because ultimately they're going to be the ones who are using the forms and collecting the data. And you want to make sure that they're able to use the forms properly and that their experience uh, is positive. You don't want to take the time to build out a form without keeping in mind uh, the data collector's needs and then that form is not usable. The next consideration is going to be what type of workflow you should use to build the forms. And when I say workflow, I'm not necessarily speaking about uh, the actual use of the forms, but the form building process, setting up your work environment. And I'm going to be talking about some best practices to help speed that process up for you. And the final project consideration is going to be where you can add form functionality, uh, what we call smart controls, to cut down on human error and input. Now, because this webinar is Form Building 101, we're not going to go too deep into smart controls today, but what I will be doing is showing you some of the capabilities that smart controls can offer in terms of enhancing your forms, taking a basic form and making it uh, more user-friendly and more intuitive. Now, as I mentioned earlier, all of these project considerations are going to lead to your best practices. These are not necessarily you know, set in stone rules that you have to absolutely follow, but we believe that these are going to give you the best experience working with iForm Builder and allowing you to create uh, exceptional data collection projects. So, moving on to these best practices. Um, these practices, again, are advice for planning your projects and successfully building your forms. I have five best practices outlined for you here today. The first one is going to revolve around understanding the iForm elements. The second best practice is going to focus on uh, the planning of your forms and how you're going to organize them. The third best practice will involve talking about building forms with end users in mind. The fourth will involve setting up your solid workflow. And the fifth, I saved the most important for last, is going to be following our golden rules. And our golden rules are really, uh, they end up being three three pieces of advice that are really crucial to your to building out your forms and making sure that uh, it's not going to interrupt anything that you're doing as you as you build out those forms. So, the first best practice is that you want to understand the iForm elements. Now, whenever I say element, uh, and you'll see this throughout the interface uh, as well as some presentations and documentation you see on our help desk, uh, element is equivalent to the word widget, the word input or the word input type. So just know if you see any of those words, they're all synonymous. Now iForm Builder has over 30 elements and that uh, amount of elements is constantly growing. The elements fall into a couple of different categories that I like to highlight. Aside from your basic text capture elements, we also include elements that uh, offer features such as masking, which is going to be where you set a specific pattern that the input has to follow. Uh, this is useful for things like a social security number, uh, phone number, or if you have some sort of, of formatted, formatted string that you want the user to always adhere to, you can use those masking elements. Option lists are another element type that is critical to your form building process. An option list is basically going to be a set of valid inputs that the user is restricted to. So if I have a set of US states, I'm going to have an option list built out that has each one of the states listed. So this way I know the user can't enter a different value. Moreover, given the, the state analogy again, uh, if a user wants to enter in the state, there's a lot of different ways they could format that. They could type in the state's name, it could be an uppercase, the first letter could be capitalized, or they could use an abbreviation. They could even misspell the state name. By predefining your values in an option list, you eliminate all of that potential error. And in iForm Builder, there are a variety of different elements that revolve around using option lists. We also offer elements that I like to call enhancements. Um, these are going to be uh, elements that you aren't able to do on a normal paper form, such as having a timer or being able to take pictures using your camera on your phone. And finally, the last category of elements are our scanning and hardware elements. These include our Manatee Works element that allows you to scan barcodes. 
Uh, we also have a temperature probe um, element as well as our Esri widget, which allows you to uh, use drop points uh, using the, uh, the GPS satellites. Now, if you by choosing the proper elements and making sure that your form is collecting data in the most efficient way possible, you're going to have a smarter data collection process. What this means is you're going to be reducing user error, meaning that the user is not going to be able to enter improper inputs as easily. You're also going to be able to accelerate the speed in which you do the data collection. For example, instead of a user having to write out pass or fail, pass or fail for a list of inspection elements, they can just have an, an option list set up where they choose one or the other, and that process will be much quicker than them writing it out. And then lastly, by having a smarter data collection, you're going to be able to homogenize your, uh, the format of your data, meaning that all the data that's collected will be in one format, and you can always count on that format being the way it is. This will allow you to then interface with other, uh, with other applications and use that data in a more intuitive manner. Uh, using this smart data collection is also going to allow you to design smarter forms. And so this is again going back to the smart controls, which I'm going to allude to a little bit, but not go too deeply into. But our smarter form design is going to allow you to do things like dynamically populate values on fields. What that means is you could have a field with a default value or a value that is calculated or derived from a prior input. This is also going to allow you to adaptively route your form, meaning based on a selection, a certain set of elements may or may not be visible. Uh, and this way the user doesn't see every single possible element to fill in, only the ones that applied to that path they took for their data collection. And the final part of our smart form design is going to be your client side validation. And so what that means is if a user puts in an, a value, you can write client-side validation that will check that value against a certain set of criteria to make sure that the value is acceptable. Otherwise, they can be prompted to revisit that value, amend it, and resubmit. The next best practice is going to be about the planning and the organization of your forms. Now, uh, the biggest part of this best practice is going to revolve around the use of subforms. And so I want to take a minute to really talk about subforms in a little bit more detail. So your subforms are a modular solution to building lengthy forms. What that means is by having a form that has, say, 100 elements in it, you can take that form, identify areas that are generally grouped together, and create subforms for each one of those sections. So now a form of originally 100 elements can become a form where you have four sections, each one with 25. Or perhaps one of those sections could be even split out further, so that 25 becomes now a section of 12 and 13. Now the reason these are modular are because each one of those subforms that you create are actually just a normal form. So the difference between you know, a subform and a parent form is just in the way that you implement it. Both of them can be used standalone. They could both be set as a subform or as a parent form. And so what this allows you to do is, if you have a, a section of a form that may be used in multiple instances, you only have to build that form once, you attach it to your different parent forms as a subform, and now you've reduced the amount of work you have to do. Okay. Now, also, each one of your subforms is going to be stored in its own table. So for every form that you make, and you'll see this throughout the literature, you also see the word table name. And oftentimes, table and form are synonymous. You can think of the form as being the outward facing uh, interface for your data collection. Your form is what the end user actually uh, interacts with to collect the data. On the other hand, your table is going to be what is in your, your dedicated database or in your account that actually holds the information, it holds the data. And anytime you make a subform, because they're created just like a normal form, that data is going to be stored in its own table. What this will allow you to do is, if you have certain sets of data that you want restricted access to, you can use subforms to uh, intelligently create that sort of a workflow, where some tables are viewable by a certain group of users, others are hidden. And so even though you may have a parent form that has multiple sections to be filled out, by creating subforms and having the data stored in its own table, 
Um, each one of those tables can have different view rights set for them. Hey, John. Yes. Do you mind um, just kind of explaining a little more about as you're collecting the data um, and how it might be separate from us, like, let's say you have multiple projects going on um, and how those subforms are going to be separate from each other for each project so that, you know, there's not, I guess, cross-contamination with uh, the data? Sure, absolutely. So, um, going back to this concept of each one of your forms being its own table, what happens is if you have a form, we'll say if, if you have form A and one of the elements is a subform that points to form B, uh, to form B basically what will happen is there is an identifier that says within that form A, that record, that points to a record in form B. So when you're looking at the data in form A, you can then go to form B's data, but if you use that subform in multiple, in multiple parent forms, that record is only associated with, uh, with the parent form based on that ID. So there is a direct link to each one of them. So it's not as if, you know, one, one subform record is going to accidentally be recognized as, as the record to another parent form. Does that, does that clear that up a little bit, Alahe? Yeah, I think so. Um, I'll let you know if there are any more questions. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Now, uh, the next point about, my sub for, about subforms is that they can be displayed both inline or standalone. And this really goes to uh, the user experience with how they're going to be interacting with their subforms. So every time you create a record, it's going to be shown in a small uh, list view. And when you create subforms, they can either be displayed in line with the parent form, or they could be displayed as a standalone list. And when this is really useful, is going down to the next point that subforms are capable of, uh, of single or multiple submission. And so what that means is, with a subform, you can create either a one-to-one -one relationship where within the parent form, you'll have one subform record, right? Or you could create what we call a one-to-many relationship. A one-to-many relationship is where for a single parent, you can then have multiple subform records. And let me give an example of this. Right? So for a multiple submission um, context, if you look over here in the slides, uh, I have two forms here. I have my first, my parent form on the left, that is going to be a basic mailing information form. There's three uh, elements for data input, the first name, your last name, and then it's going to link to a subform that's going to collect my address information. Now, the next form on the right is going to be the form that is going to collect the address information. The first thing I'm going to do is select whether it is a home address, a work address, or, or other. Afterwards, I'll fill out the information, and then when I click on done, that record is now attached to my parent subform. Now, if I'm collecting information um, on my addresses, I may have a single address, just a home address I want to supply, or if I have multiple addresses, I can also do that as well. All right, so if I want, I could then add another address for home, fill that out. I could add another work address if, I, if I'm working two jobs. And at that point, I've created a one-to-many relationship where for my single uh, record in the parent form mailing information, I now have three subform records as addresses. Okay. And the last point about subforms I want to talk about is the fact that you're able to uh, aggregate data from them. So within iForm Builder, we have some built-in functions that allow you to calculate both the sum of values across subform records uh, as well as the average of values. And these are useful when you are collecting multiple records for the same data point and you want to run some real basic analytics on them within iForm Builder and within the actual, the actual form. So you're able to very quickly and automatically aggregate those values to get, a, uh, to get the sum of you know, a subform field or to get the average of it. The second part about planning the organization of your form that I want to focus on is the naming conventions. And if you remember going back to those initial project considerations, we talked about the organization of your forms and, uh, and this comes down to how you want to name them. Now I've used the term parent and child a few times already throughout this webinar and I want to expand on that a little bit. 
The idea of this is that for a form that is at the top, you want to consider that the parent or the originator, that original form. That form may have a subform, and because it's linked that way, we often refer to that as a child form. Okay? So for a given parent, it may have a child. Okay? Now, within that child form, you could have another subform. Right? At that point, you would have what we call a grandchild form. And so we follow that organizational structure to name your forms out. Now, the name of convention that I've found works best for me and that's worked, worked best for a lot of the other people who I've worked with using iForm Builder is to actually use a lowercase p and a lowercase c in their form names as they're building out those forms. And the lowercase p is going to stand for parent. The lowercase c is going to stand for child. And if you look at the screenshot I have over here, I have a set of forms that are going to be focused on elevator inspection. And I have that underscore P for the form that's going to be the parent form. And any subforms related to that, I'm going to give the underscore C. And this way, when you're searching through a long list of forms, because the first part of the form name is similar, they're going to be grouped together. And then that underscore P or the underscore C lets you quickly know if you're working with a subform or if you're going to be working with a parent form. Our third best practice is going to be building forms with end users in mind. And uh, I always describe two primary axes when it comes to the different contexts that you may have in terms of your end users interacting with iForm. The first axis is going to be the operating system of the device they're using. And this breaks down to whether they're using Android or they're using iOS. Now, within iForm, we have those, that, those 30 plus elements and the gap between them is ever closing. There are a few elements um, that were not supported on Android but that are supported on iOS. Uh, and again, like I said, that gap is closing. Most recently, the drawing widget, uh, or the, the drawing element, I'm sorry, uh, is now fully supported on Android. The other thing to keep in mind is that some of the elements, some of the displays may be slightly different based on your operating system. So if you know which device your users are going to be collecting data with, if it's a single operating system, then be sure to you know, test on that device. Uh, if they're using a mix of the two, be sure to test on both. The second axis is going to be focused on the size of the data collection device, whether they're working off of a smartphone or they may be working off of a tablet. And the primary emphasis here is that when you have longer labels or any sort of, of descriptive text, you want to make sure that it displays properly on the device that you'll be using. The last thing you want to do is develop a form testing on an iPad, and then all of your end users are going to be collecting data on a smaller iPhone, and the forms don't display the way you had expected them to. So again, those are the two main axes. Uh, there are also considerations such as you know, whether the data collectors are going to have uh, signal when they're collecting data, if they're going to need to be collecting data in an offline environment, or if they're going to be connected the entire time. And things like that can also play a role. Uh, and it's just important to really have a good understanding of what the data collection process is going to look like from their end. The fourth best practice is going to focus on setting up a solid workflow. And I think that this is one of the most important uh, considerations when you are building out your iForm projects. I know that for me, as I learned how to use the platform, I slowly modified the way I would set up my workflow uh, and my workspace as well so that I would have a more efficient form building uh, experience. So a couple of tips I have for you in setting up a solid workflow. The first one is to plan out your forms, subforms, and option lists. Now, this doesn't have to be within the platform. Uh, for me personally, I actually really like using a piece of paper and writing it out. I like drawing out kind of how my, I expect my forms to look, what I can identify as being a subform, and also your option list, ha you know, writing out all the possible values. By taking that initial time and that initial investment to plan out these, these steps and that organization, you're going to significantly reduce the amount of amending and the amount of editing and updating you have to do afterwards. 
The second piece of advice I have for you is to use multiple browser tabs. And so what I'm going to do real quickly is go out, and I was actually working on some forms earlier today, and I want to show you my browser. Okay? And so what I have here is I have my iPhone Builder interface here as my first browser, and I was actually working on three separate forms that are each connected, so I have a parent and two subforms, and I have each one of them open as a separate tab. What this lets me do is if I need to, for example, take a data column name and use it in another form, I can quickly highlight, copy, and then paste as I need. Right? By not constantly switching back and forth between opening forms and closing them or having to type out values all the time, you're going to one speed up your process and two, you're also going to reduce your typing errors by just copying and pasting values as you need. The fourth part about setting up your solid workflow is making sure that you have the devices you want to test on hand. Um, so if I'm going to be collecting data again, going back to the previous best practice about the two axes, if I'm collecting data only on iPads, okay, then I obviously want to have an iPad available to test on. Uh, if I'm going to be collecting data across, you know, a multiple, uh, a wider set of, of devices, then I want to do my best to have each one of them present for me to test. I know that for me, as I was testing forms earlier this morning, uh, I had my iPad, my iPhone, and an Android phone out, and I was testing across all three different, um, different devices so that I could make sure that the results I had were consistent across each one of them. And the final part about setting up your solid workflow is that you want to test early and test often. Uh, I know that for me, it's really tempting to, once you get into the builder, you know, build out your, your form and just work on it and really focus on getting all those 30 different elements set up exactly the way you want. The problem with that is inevitably when you go ahead and sync your device and something doesn't work exactly how you expected it to, you now have 30 elements that you need to look through to start figuring out what went wrong. Once you start working with JavaScript and using your smart controls, this becomes even more difficult to, to pinpoint in terms of where the problem is. So I always advocate to people that you want to test early and test often. Work in small, manageable pieces. It doesn't have to be one element at a time or one line at a time. But work in a, in a manageable chunk of space where then when you test, if it doesn't work, it's not going to be too laborious figuring out exactly where you went wrong. What I normally do is I actually write out and develop my forms in sets of maybe three to four elements, uh, especially if they're going to be interacting with one another, so that you know I check one set of, of outcomes, and assuming they work, then I'll build off of it, and then I'll continue moving forward in that respect. I don't want to build out my entire project, sync my device, cross my fingers, and hope it works. Uh, that's going to set you up to have to do a lot of revisions. It's going to also set you up where you're going to be lost and not know where to find the errors. And what will happen a lot of times is one error may lead to another, and then you're really going to be uh, extending the amount of time it takes to develop your forms. So again, just to recap these, setting up a solid workflow is going to focus and revolve around having an initial planning phase, uh, setting up multiple browser tabs. So use your, your computer to your advantage. Open up each one of those forms you're working with. You want to have the devices on hand that you're going to be using for data collection. And finally, make sure you work in manageable chunks, right? Test early and test often. Don't develop too much before you test and make sure that that section of your form works. All right. Moving forward now, let's talk about your form builder, form building golden rule. And again, I said this earlier, and I'm going to reiterate, uh, these are three rules that uh, we feel are, it's, you know, it's imperative to communicate to people who are building forms because they can really mess with your workflow uh, and, you know, make the form building experience not as positive as, as it should be. So the first form building golden rule is to test your form on multiple devices before going live and deploying to users. Uh, now, I talked about this a little bit in terms of, you know, testing on different devices and keeping your end users in mind. The real big takeaway here actually is that you want to extensively test your form before going live. 
once your form is, is live and it's in use and people are depending on its availability uh, to do their jobs, it becomes exceedingly tricky uh, to make edits to that form and to make sure that you can make the changes you need to make without interrupting their workflow. So you want to make sure you test on all the different device types. And in terms of building your forms, if you have different sizes of, of data collection devices, the default is going to be to build for the smallest device. Right? You want to make sure that your form displays on whatever the smallest size device you're going to be using is. For the devices that are larger than that, you know, it's going to be a bonus. They're just going to be a little bit more clear. They're going to be a little, they're going to look a little better. But what you don't want to have happen is designing and developing your form for a large device. And then when someone with a smaller device uses it, it doesn't render properly or the way you had hoped it would. Okay. So again, I want to really, really emphasize this. You want to fully and extensively test your forms before going live and having your data collectors use it. Once your form is live, it becomes much harder to properly uh, edit and update your forms without interrupting their workflow. The second golden rule is going to make sure that your data column names or your DCNs are database friendly. Okay? And so uh, from a high level point of view, the, the simple way of explaining it is that there are certain words that you cannot use as a data column name. Not that the data column name cannot include those words, but that specific word cannot be the entirety of the, the name. Uh, for those of you who may be a little bit more, more uh, uh, tech savvy, those words, the reasons they're reserved is because they're used within the system, whether that's the, the database that's storing it or the, the iPhone builder system itself. Those words are reserved and so they already have a purpose and a meaning and so they cannot be used as a data column name. The example that comes up more often than any of the other ones is using the data column name location for our location element, which is going to be the element that gives you GPS coordinates. Um, that word is reserved, and so when you try to create a form with that as your data column name, it's going to give you an error that says that that name is not allowed. Now, assuming you get this error, and you have to be careful about this small little hiccup in the system, you're going to need to uh, refresh and reload that web page and then go back and change the value of your data column name. It's really important you reload the page because what's going to happen is it's not going to allow you to save any edits you make. Uh, after you get that error message, it's going to put you in a bit of an infinite loop. And so you want to refresh immediately because if you start doing a bunch of other work, it's not going to be able to be saved. So again, if you get that error message, reload your page immediately. After the page is reloaded, you want to uncheck the based on label toggle, which is right underneath the data column name. And then you can now type in a data column name that is different than the label, uh, that will not be in conflict with our reserved words. And also for your reference, um, within the PDF you're going to, that you're going to get, there's a link here, and you can also find the link if you search for it on our help desk, of reserved words that cannot be used as data column names. And so this list is really great. I know I personally have it printed out and I, I keep it next to me every time I'm building forms uh, just to make sure that I am not writing data column names that are going to be in conflict. John, we have a couple of comments on this. Um, okay. So one of them was that I guess a form was recycled from a few months ago. And once mm -hmm. they had recycled the form, they came to find out that the data that was collected on the form you know, previously before it was recycled was now missing on the map that was linked to the data. Um, the photos in particular were gone, which is, um, I don't know if you want to add any insight to that. Okay, so so they took a form and they started using it again. Is that what they were doing? Yep. Yeah, so they had a form, and I guess, for, and had collected data with that form um, and then went to use it again and recycled it, and then some of the things were missing um, that had been linked to that. Okay, uh, that could be caused by a lot, for a lot of different reasons. It's hard to know uh, and give a definitive answer without really looking into it a little bit deeper. Um, one of the things that I do make sure to, to communicate to people is that whenever you have those, those media files that you're, you're connecting, uh, and this comes up during uh, the migration process from your, your public account to a dedicated database, uh, 
if you have the the path of the server name as part of that configuration and it changes, then a lot of times that link can be severed or it'll be it'll be broken and you need to repair it. Sometimes that repair happens on the iPhone builder side of things by changing your configuration settings within the web portal. Sometimes that change is going to be made on the media, you know, wherever you're storing the media, um, where you have to update the, the iForm data configuration stuff on their end. So that's probably the most common reason for that happening. If it's a form that you've been collecting data with previously, um, you know, and if, if you moved, if the, the profile was migrated during that time, I could see that being a reason for it happening. Um, otherwise, what I would suggest actually is if you want to, and this goes for anyone actually, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to shoot me an email. The email was on the first uh, page of the presentation and it'll also be at the end. And I'm always happy to help with any sort of, of, of questions like this that, that people have, any sort of difficulties. Um, I'll do my best to answer anything. And if I am unable to answer it, I will most certainly direct the question to someone who I know can give the proper answer to. And I just dropped it into the chat as well. Okay, sounds um, good. The other one was that when there's a copy-paste element from one form to the other, um, there, oh, sorry, let me, notice that when I had copy-paste elements from one form to another by mistake, um, didn't catch it until there was an error message. It was saved but hard to locate the error. So the DCN was repeated, the data column name was repeated in the form. Ah, uh, yeah, so this happens too sometimes. Uh, especially if you are taking, so within a single form, right? What I did earlier was I took the data column name from one form, copied it and pasted it to a different form, right? So it was okay if the, if the value was the same. I was using it in the, the condition value field, which is one of our smart controls. If you're working within a single form uh, and you have your data column names where they are matching, right? So you have the exact same data column names, uh, that's not going to be allowed, and so you're going to run into that error. Uh, to avoid that, what I normally do is, um, once I have my form planned out, so when I do that paper planning step, and I know all the elements that I want to have, I'm going to add the appropriate number of elements. Say I have a form of 17 elements, I'll add 17 inputs. And then after I have them all added, I'll then go through and make sure the names of them are all unique and and appropriate to what I want, so I set the labels and the, the name if it's going to be different than the label. Then I'm going to go into the individual elements sometimes and, you know, and edit uh, the specific properties for that. And actually that, um, I just, you know, it just made me think of something when I was talking about my workflow, uh, and I said this earlier that, you know, these are not set in stone rules, but that's another workflow that you can follow. So instead of building your form in small sections at a time, you can also think of building your form in layers, right? So if you want to get all the elements shown, then you want to get all the names set up, you can also do it in waves like that. And that's another, another workflow that, that is appropriate depending on your context again, right? So if I'm doing a large form with all the same type of inputs, I might do it that way sometimes, uh, especially if it's not going to have a whole lot of smart controls in it. But yeah, going back to the original comment or the original question, uh, when you're copying and pasting, be careful about the data column names matching within a single form. Each data column name has to be unique. Wonderful. That's it for now. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, our third form builder golden rule, uh, and this one is super, super important, is that you do not want to change the, uh, the element input type the data size or whether the element is going to be encrypted or not on a live form. Okay? Uh, and a live form again is going to be a form that already has data associated with it. The reason you don't want to change these things is because that data is going to be deleted. Right? So again I want to talk about this a little bit. If you have a, an input or an element and you change, say, for example, the input type, right? Say the input was originally a number, and then you change it to text. Understand that the input type also affects the way that your database table is structured, and so certain database, uh, certain input types are going to have certain properties 
on the database table. These three in particular are going to cause a process where when you update that field, even though it looks like an update outwardly facing for the data collector or for the, the form builder, on the back end of things, what you're really doing is you're taking that column, deleting it, and recreating it because the input type, the encryption, and the data size are that integral to the structure of the table. And so what happens is if you have records that are already stored that have uh, values in that field or in that column, those values are going to be lost. To avoid this, and so again, this is your, this is your pitfall, and I'm giving you a way to circumvent it. To avoid this, what you want to do is, with that original element, you actually want to disable it by clicking on the disable checkbox, and that will hide it. It'll, it'll make it so that the, the field is not used anymore in the form, but that row or that column will persist within the table, so you're not going to lose any of your data. After you disable the, the element, you're then going to want to duplicate it so that you basically get a copied element with the same properties as the one that you just now disabled. And in this new element, you can then make the changes that you want for the original. Once this new element is set up properly, any records that are collected thereafter are going to be assigned into that data column. And so when it comes to aggregating your records and, your, and the data you've collected, you do have to keep in mind that uh, that data point is going to be split across two columns. You have your old column and your new column. But the important thing is that you're not going to lose your data there. Right? And so again, I want to talk through the steps of this. You want to disable the original input. Then you want to duplicate it. Make the changes on the newly created element and then use that element moving forward uh, in the live forms afterwards. All right. uh, Ella, hey, were there any questions uh, about any of those, uh, those best practices or anything that I've covered so far? Um, there was one from before about when you get the error message. Um, mm -hmm. How do you identify that the element how do you identify the element that has the repeated data column name? Um, and then also, I guess a second question is, is all of the data deleted or just those associated with that element? Mm, okay, I'll answer that second question first. It's just gonna be that column. So you're not gonna lose the entire record. You're just gonna lose that column in the table. So that one single data point for that one field. It's not gonna be the entire record. Uh, in terms of finding the field that has the repeated data column name, uh, Going back to my best practice regarding workflow, right? If you have, a, if you're working in smaller chunks, it's obviously a lot easier to find where that element is. Uh, the other thing is, generally speaking, uh, most often I see labels that are going to be very similar to the data column name, or actually, what ends up happening is the data column name is similar to the text that you have for the label. So, depending on the name of the data column. Looking for a label that matches it is going to be a good way to do that. Um, the other thing you'll want to do is just like how we have a naming convention for forms, uh, it might be in your best interest to kind of set up and plan a naming convention for your individual elements as well. Uh, and for something that specific, we don't really have a best practice set for the naming of different elements. Uh, that's going to really come down to your individual needs and your individual context and workflow. That'll uh, you know fit those best. But those two things definitely, you know, set up a good naming convention so that you can easily identify the element that a data column name is associated with, and then also working in smaller manageable pieces and chunks so that if and when a problem arises, it's going to be a lot easier to find where it is. Thank you. And then one more question, um, I guess for you, but also other attendees, if they have the same issue of why sometimes the lat and long elements, sometimes they might work, sometimes they might not. Um, I don't know if you or if others have run into the same issue, if it's you know a bug that our de dev team needs to know, or if you might have another uh, answer to that. Sure. The, so the location element, I, I actually tend to call it a GPS element, because that's really 
what I use it for, where it gives you the latitude and the longitude. Uh, sometimes if you're running into issues where your connectivity is, is a little poor, uh, it may not be able to, to refresh properly. Uh, I've had that happen sometimes. Um, other times, you know, I, honestly, because I do most of the testing in the same place here at the office every day, I don't run into a whole lot of issues like that. Um, but what I do want to, to highlight is, uh, especially for the attendees, if you're running into issues like that uh, or any sort of experience that you're having with the platform, uh, within our customer success center, there is a, a category for the community, and what we see a lot of is iForm users interact with, with one another, sharing their experiences in there, and a lot of times when it comes to creating real specific uh, errors or real specific use cases where something may not work properly, uh, it's hard for us to imagine all those possible, you know, all the possible occurrences, but because we have such a strong community behind us, uh, there's a good chance that somebody else may have run into the same issue and they may either have a viable workaround or, you know, through their postings, we've actually addressed it there as well. So if you're running into issues with any of the elements, aside from reaching out to myself or anyone else on our team, uh, I do want to direct people towards that community section of the Customer Success Center to interact with other users because a lot of times those experiences can be shared and there's a lot we can learn from them. Perfect. Thank you. That's it for now. Sounds good. Now, uh, the, the changes I talked about, the process I talked about in terms of updating a field that needs to be changed, uh, there are steps that you have to do in terms of updating an option list as well. Uh, and I have these outlined here for you within the presentation. I did just want to kind of go and show you all each one of these slides. I'm not going to talk about them in depth, but these slides, this one, and this slide here specifically regarding how to make changes to your option list are a really, really good reference and a good resource for anyone who is new to form building or anyone who has run into this issue and needs kind of that, you know, that one page set of notes to make sure that they go through the process correctly in terms of updating your option list. Now, moving on, this is going to be the third part of the webinar. Uh, I want to talk to you all about the process of converting a paper form to a to the digital platform using iForm Builder and what that looks like. So to do this, what I did was I found a form that I wanted to convert. And for this webinar, we're going to use the context of an elevator inspection. And what I did was within this form, uh, I highlighted two areas that I, you'll see boxed out in red on the left, and I have them zoomed in over here on the right, that we're going to be using for our form today. So real quickly, I'll go through it. Uh, at the top, you're going to have the unit type, where there are three different possible uh, types of elevator, whether it's a dumbwaiter, a passenger elevator or a freight elevator. Then the data collector is going to have to specify what type of inspection it is, whether it's a periodic inspection for, for maintenance and upkeep, or if it's an acceptance inspection for the, the first time the elevator is going to be inspected. After that, we have a section for building and unit information, including the name of the building, the address, uh, the representative for the building, and then information regarding the elevator itself, the unit identification, the manufacturer, and certain, um, certain data points that need to be collected, including the speed and the capacity in terms of, of how many pounds the elevator is able to hold. After that, I chose one of the four sections below um, as different points of inspection. So in this case, we're going to be looking at inspection points that occur inside of the elevator car itself. And what you'll see here is there are 19 different inspection points. Each one is going to have either a passing rating of being okay, a failing rating, the NG stands for not good, and then the NA is going to stand for not applicable. So, you know, that, um, that data point may not apply to the particular elevator that is being inspected at the time. And, you know, this is a pretty straightforward paper form. Um, filling out each one of the fields is going to be a lot of, of writing by the inspector. And I want to show you what this would look like uh, 
when we use iForm Builder. I'm also going to be following the steps that I outlined earlier regarding the best practices, and the first thing I want to talk about is planning out this form. So, the first step of planning out my form is I'm going to look for potential areas to use option lists. And the reason is your option lists are going to be the best types of elements for restricting user input. Because all of the possible values are predefined, I do not need to worry about the data collector entering a value that is not on that list. And for here, I've identified three areas. Uh, the unit type has three possible values. The inspection type has two. And then each one of these inspection points has three. The next thing I'm going to want to do is I'm going to identify fields that have a specific format or that I know the values are going to be consistently matching a set of criteria. And for this, I have three different fields selected. The first one is going to be my phone number, and I know that the phone number is going to have a specific format to it. And the next two are going to be the speed of the elevator, measured in feet per minute, and then the capacity of the elevator, measured in pounds. Each one of these two fields I know is going to be a numeric value, and so then what I can do is use the appropriate element to collect that data. This way I don't have to worry about, you know, somebody putting in a set of, of letters or, or some sort of symbol for the speed or the capacity. Again, limiting the amount of interaction the user has with the form. The third part of the planning is going to be identifying sections that can be pulled out as subforms. And I've identified two in this case. The first one is going to be the building and unit information. And the second subform is going to be my list of inspection items. After building out the form, what it's going to look like is I'm going to have a parent form. Uh, in this case, I call it elevator inspection. And it will have my type of elevator, the type of inspection, and then it's going to have two subforms. One of them is going to be for the building information. The other one is going to be a, uh, the subform for the inside of the car inspection list. For the building information, uh, I have different elements used here. I have a phone number field used for the phone number, uh, and then the number element used for the speed and the capacity. And actually, the other thing I did was, uh, for the manufacturer, you know, I thought there, there probably aren't too many elevator manufacturers out there. And so what I actually did was I went and made an option list for those as well, and I set that up as a pick list. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you what this form looks like on my iPad. So I'm going to go over here to elevator inspection. And you'll see here, this is very similar to the screenshot I had earlier. I have my three different types of units. It could be a dumbwaiter, a passenger elevator, or a freight elevator. And again, this is the select element, one of the option list types. And the select is going to be used where there's a small number of options available because all of them are shown on the screen. So what this does is it really in, uh, it speeds up the process for the data collector. They don't have to go to another screen or open up another window to see all of the different options possible. Inspection type is the same. You have one of two options for this. For the building information, when I select it, you'll see that it now pulls up the subform. And the subform is going to have all of these fields. So I could have a building name. I can enter this in here. After the building name, it's going to give me the address. I'm just going to put in some simple values here for the sake of time. This is my phone number element, and you'll see that it has a specific format set up for this. And again, I'm just going to put in some dummy values. The building representative, I can go ahead and type in their name. I think that I will be the building representative today. Unit ID, let's go ahead and give this a random serial number. And now this is your pick list. Your pick list is going to be good where you select a single value from the list, but the list is too long where it can't be shown as a select. So in this case, I have a small scrolling list here. If I want, I can also go up here and search for the value I want within the pick list for a list that are exceedingly long. Uh, in this case, I'll just select one of the manufacturers. 
And then finally, I have my speed, which has to be a number, feet per minute, and the capacity of the elevator, which will be in pounds. And what I did here is, in the form, it has you know, the, the unit of measurement, FPM or, or pounds, uh, next to the space where the data collector would write it. What I did to accommodate that on my digital form is I wrote in that that's the unit within the label of the element so that the data collector sees that. After I fill out my subform, I'm going to click on Done. And now you'll see here how the three fields are listed in line with the form, going back to um, the best practice regarding subforms. And I said you could display them in line or as a list view. Because this is a one-to-one, -one, it doesn't make sense for this to have a completely separate view. Uh, it won't take up a whole lot of space, so I have it displayed in line instead. The last part of my form is going to be the inspection inside of the car. And because each of these use that option list, uh, and there's only three options available, I made every single one of them a select element. And what this lets me do as a collector is, as I'm going through, it's very quick to you know, select each of the values for each one of the data points. So we'll say our elevator passed on most all fronts. We'll click on done after I'm done here. And I can click on done once I'm finished. And I can sync my form. And then that record will be now stored to the database. Uh, Ella, are there any questions about the, uh, the form that have come up since I, I went through this little walkthrough? Yep. Um, just how do you set up? How do you set it up in inline? Are you able to show that now? Yes, I can. So, if I'm going through here, let me find my subform. So this is the element, the subform element building information. Under the input properties, I'm sorry, smart paging. You're going to see this toggle for the separate table view. If I want it in line, I'm going to leave this blank. If I want a separate view, so if I have like a one-to-many relationship where the many is going to be a lot, then I can toggle this on, and then it's going to bring up a separate table view for that subform. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to talk about today are the enhancements that are possible through the use of smart controls. And again, because this is Form Building 101, we're not going to go too in-depth with this. But I wanted to show you all some of the capabilities uh, that are possible. Hopefully, you can attend the next webinar where we'll go over some of these smart controls. And so we're going to be using smart controls to reduce and enhance user interaction. And the ones I want to show you are setting up condition values to hide elements. We're going to use dividers and labels to improve the usability of the form. That's going to be mostly uh, focus on the aesthetics. I'm going to be showing you the implementation of some page level JavaScript to calculate uh, the inspection scores for that inside of the car subform. And then we're going to be using dynamic values to populate a couple of elements that are read only. And finally, uh, reference ID2 is going to be used in terms of customizing my list view. And I will talk through each one of those again as I go through this. So this is my enhanced form. Uh, it's the same workflow as what I had before for the basic one. The first thing you'll notice is that there are no subforms for the billing information and for the inspection. This is because I have them hidden based on the control uh, on the condition value because I want the data collector to first input the unit type as well as the inspection type. And I've also included this label here telling them that that's what they need to do. So once they say that this is a passenger elevator, and it's an acceptance type inspection. Now we're going to get more elements shown. I have a divider to separate, and then another label saying to enter the building information and the inspection results. I'm going to jump over here to the elevator inspection, because this is where more of the smart controls are going to be used. Uh, real quickly, let me go ahead and select a few values here. After I filled out this form, What you'll see here is, in my inline view, I have the number of passes, the number of fails, and the number of fields that were marked as not applicable. 
And so this is actually a couple of different smart controls working uh, in unison to give you this, this snapshot of that subform. The first thing I did was I have some JavaScript working um, to count up each one of those, those data points and to keep a running total of them. The other thing I've done is those fields are actually within the subform, except that I have them set to being read-only, meaning they can't be edited, as well as being hidden, just like the, uh, the subforms were hidden initially, so that the inspector doesn't you know, see them, it doesn't take up screen space. And then the third piece of this is I actually use the reference ID number two so that those three fields, even though they're hidden from view, are going to be the fields that are shown in this inline list view. And so as you're going through the inspection, this gives you a real quick snapshot as to how the inspection went. Uh, and this can be a useful, a useful piece of information for the collector um, that might inform the next steps of what the, whatever they're doing in their workflow, or even once the record is submitted, uh, having these points of data available to anyone who's doing work or analytics with the, with the records, uh, this can also be useful for them as well. Okay. Uh, th that was the last thing I wanted to talk about for this, this webinar. The, the time's gone really quickly, actually. There's so much more I would like to talk about, but uh, we're going to try to keep this. To, we're going to be a little bit over an hour. Uh, the last thing I do want to mention is that we have a wealth of support available for you. Uh, I mentioned the Customer Success Center, where not only do you have articles and tutorials, you also have the community section where you can talk to other members of the iPhone Builder community who have used the platform and have shared their experiences. In addition to all of that, you are also able to chat with an agent, one of our representatives on the team, uh, who can help you if you have any questions. So if you have a question regarding form building, you want to get a quick answer, just hop on the Customer Success Center and there's a little chat box in the lower right, and you can use that to get help as quickly as possible. In addition to that, we also have release notes for every update we do for iForm Builder. Uh, we're constantly evolving, we're constantly improving, and those release notes are going to be your best way to keep up to date with all the changes that we've made. Uh, we also offer training. Uh, we have what we call our iForm Builder Academy, where we have some articles and tutorials set up, and there are also opportunities for you to get more training. Uh, whether it's on-site or, you know, or offline, uh, we're available for that uh, to help you out. Uh, continue to tune into these webinars, uh, you know, getting more perspectives on, on form building from the different team members. Uh, I know that this webinar in particular, uh, Form Building 101, is a recurring webinar. However, you know, each time we do these webinars, we try to put a different spin on it. So even though you may have attended this webinar before, it's my hope that you got something new out of this one. And then the last thing is we do offer certifications for iForm Builder. Uh, Ella had mentioned them at the beginning and I will close by reiterating. Uh, we do have a round of certifications coming up on October 4th and 6th. Uh, for those people who are already certified, we also do have a recertification coming up later on in October. I believe the date is October 12th and 14th. Uh, and so that's going to be a, you know, a two-day intensive uh, session working with the platform, making sure that you learn all the different techniques and, and how to use each of the different tools so that you are going to be proficient within the platform and are able to build out the forms as you wish and as you want. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in uh, and giving me the opportunity to share my experiences with you all. Uh, in the next 48 hours, you're going to be getting a couple things. You're going to receive an email, and with that email, you're going to have a link to a web page that's going to include a recording of this webinar. It's also going to have a PDF version of these slides I've used uh, during the presentation, so you have this for reference. And then the last thing I'm going to include uh, on this web page is actually a link to the form packages for this elevator inspection form that I built out for you all today. So what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to go in, import those forms, and look at the different settings and, and configurations I have so that you can, you know, take a look. If you want to uh, use some of the elements and some of the setups I have, you can take those and put them into whatever forms you're building. And it's, again, going to be a good reference, something that you can kind of dissect and learn from. Okay. Uh, Ella, hey, are there any other questions before we go ahead and close out this webinar? 
Nope, just many people thanking you for learning. They learned a lot today. Uh, that's great. That's what I want to hear. I appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a great day and a good rest of the week.